welcome to the fourth annual Professor G. Ramareddy Memorial Lecture. This lecture is organized in the memory of Professor G. Ramareddy by the Indira Gandhi National Open University in collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning. Professor G. Ramareddy is best remembered as an eminent political scientist, a leading educationist and a leader in the field of distance education. In a long and distinguished career, Professor Reddy served a number of institutions. He was the Vice Chancellor of Usmania University, Hyderabad for two terms. He was the Founder Vice Chancellor of the Andhra Pradesh Open University. He was also the Founder Vice Chancellor of the Indira Gandhi National Open University. He was the Chairman of University Grants Commission and Vice President of the Commonwealth of Learning. Our chief guest today is Professor Ian Mugridge. Professor Mugridge is former director from the Commonwealth of Learning and a historian by training and background. He is also a renowned distance educationist and was closely associated with Professor G. R. Ramareddy. Our session today is being presided by Professor A. W. Khan, currently the Vice Chancellor of the Indira Gandhi National Open University. On my right is Professor V. S. Prasad, currently the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Indira Gandhi National Open University and the Chairman uh, of the G. Ramareddy Memorial Lecture Committee. So, a tribute to Professor G. Ramareddy by Professor A. W. Khan. Professor G. Ramareddy, the founder of the Open University System and the first Vice Chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University is no more with us physically. But the system and policies that he laid down and a large number of functionaries that he carefully nurtured for the open university system will continue to keep him alive as the eternal guiding spirit of the open university system in the country. Before his great soul left the mortal body, he was already beyond the clutches of death. As if following the call of Upanishads, Ma Mrityo Udgat Vasham, do not be overpowered by death. Professor Reddy was a rare personality who not only had a clear vision but also had an ability to translate his vision into reality. He once told me that he had realized most of his dreams in life. To him, the strength of Open University lay in the quality of the learning materials and its student support services. The student support system of IGNU, the foundation of which was carefully designed by him, has today grown and further diversified. As a tribute to the great pioneer, we have today dedicated the newly constructed student services center on the IGNU campus to Professor J. Ram Reddy. The student services center, fully air conditioned and with land connectivity, will provide single window service to all the students visiting the headquarters. We propose to establish similar centers, single window centers at all the regional centers of IGNU. At some regional centers, it is already in existence. Today is a solemn occasion as we observe the fourth death anniversary of Professor J. Ram Reddy to express our gratitude to the great pathfinder and also to rededicate ourselves to realize the ideals that he cherished. Professor Reddy was not only a great leader, a scholar, a visionary, an innovator, an educational system creator, an institution builder, but a great human being in whose company everyone from the highest to the lowest level, experience the genuine warmth and noble soul full of love, compassion and friendliness. All these attributes contributed to his unparalleled su success in all the coveted positions he occupied during his illustrious life. In fact, he was called Ajat Shatru, someone who does not have enemies. Although Professor Reddy received a number of awards and honors during his lifetime, he was posthumously conferred the award of Honorary Fellow of the Commonwealth of Learning 
at Brunei conference in March 99. With the fast expansion of distance education system covering more and more areas of studies and attracting large number of large numbers, the major concern is the quality assurance. This was also Professor Reddy's beloved objective as he always used to emphasize the need for excellence. It is therefore most appropriate that today's Professor Jiram Reddy Memorial Lecture by Professor Ian Magridge be on the theme of quality assurance in open and distance education. It is therefore most appropriate that Professor Magridge is delivering the fourth Professor Jiram Reddy Memorial, Memorial Lecture today. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Ian Magridge. Mrs. Reddy, Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a commonplace of occasions like this for the invited speaker to begin by saying what a pleasure and privilege it is to be asked to give the lecture in question. Often this privilege and pleasure is somewhat mitigated by the speakers having the problem of deciding what subject it is most appropriate to, to address. But in this case, even this has not occurred since the Vice Chancellor has been thoughtful enough to provide me with my subject as well, quality assurance in open and distance education. I first discussed visiting India with Ram Reddy soon after he was appointed Vice Chancellor of Indira Gandhi National Open University. My response to his suggestion that I visit his institution was that I would be very interested in coming to this country. His reply contained something of a hint that part of the country's problem may lie in the fact that so many of my countrymen had been similarly interested in coming here. The visit did not, however, take place until 1992, after he had left IGNU, spent some years as Vice President of the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver, and returned here as Chairman of the University Grants Commission. The occasion was a joint UGC CLL seminar on reforms in higher education, and this was followed two years later by a symposium jointly sponsored by the UGC and the Distance Education Council on quality assurance in open and distance education. In the second case in particular, he had been instrumental in organizing the event and had thrown his weight behind it and the Three Nation Tour of Indi Indian Distance Educators that produced the collection of essays on quality assurance that was published with the symposium. It is thus particularly appropriate that the Vice Chancellor has asked me to talk about this subject today. In an earlier draft of this lecture, I had begun this section with the comment that open and distance education has undergone and is undergoing major changes as we approach the millennium. Apart from the fact that such a comment is hardly worth making, it, is surely, it, it also occurred to me that surely we all deserve at least one lecture like this that does not refer to the coming millennium, and so this will be my only reference to it. Research in higher education suggests that students learn best when they engage in active learning in a rich and supportive learning environment. Such an environment provides students with a wide array of learning resources, with the means of communicating readily with teachers as well as fellow students through appropriately structured learning activities, and with the necessary means of supporting their work. It has often been assumed that it is easier to provide such an environment in campus-based face-to-face teaching, and this may well be the case, though increasingly I doubt it in these days of what Professor Pent now calls omnipresent education. But most of us who have practiced open and distance education over the last 20 or 30 years would argue that we have always sought to provide, even in conventional print-based ed distance education courses, a rich learning environment for our students by attempting to build into their learning materials educational processes that support active learning. Nevertheless, the common impression has been, and still is in many quarters, that distance education is very much content-driven. As Sir John Daniel has noted, 
Much of the commercial hype and hope about distance education is based on a very unidirectional conception of instruction where teaching is merely presentation and learning is merely absorption. He goes on to state, however, that the Open University's experience with two million students over 25 years suggests that such an impoverished notion of distance education will fail, or at least have massive dropout problems. With the changes both in technology and technique that have occurred in open and distance education over the last 15 to 20 years, it is increasingly possible to argue that institutions providing properly designed and delivered open and distance education often produce a much richer and more effective learning environment than the lecture-based mass higher education typical of most large universities, at least of those with which I am familiar in North America. This has, of course, become more true with the incorporation of more and more sophisticated communications technologies into open and distance education. We are now able, in ways not previously possible, to orchestrate educational processes through the use of such techniques as electronic mail, computer conferencing, and so on. In principle, it is possible for open and distance education at the university level to meet Diane Lorillard's four criteria for good teaching, which are that it be discursive by allowing students and teachers to communicate ideas to one another and to receive feedback, interactive by encouraging students to take actions to demonstrate learning and to receive feedback on them, adaptive by building on learning experiences to determine future suitable learning experiences, and reflective by encouraging students to reflect on and benefit from the feedback they receive. The challenge for open and distance educators is to make use of new technologies in ways that enhance learning, that are educationally process-oriented, and that thus emphasize communication and reflection over simple transfer of content. This challenge must be taken up against a background in which much of the media discussion of, for example, virtual universities seems grounded in a content transfer mo model of education and in which many politicians and even university administrators support such a model because of its cheapness. A concurrent problem is that to base participation in open and distance education on a requirement that, that students have access to the internet means that those who have it will gain while those who do not will be left behind. This is a problem anywhere, even in institutions where a high percentage of students do have access to the internet. The issue in such cases is to provide quality learning for those students with the technological resources to take advantage of new methods, while at the same time providing learning of equal quality for those who do not have that capacity. This, as I have said, is a problem anywhere but it is immeasurably a greater one for developing countries, for institutions like Indira Gandhi National Open University and the other Indian distance teaching universities. The simple fact is, however, that the developing technologies are not going to go away and that they are going to be used. The challenge, as I have already noted, is to make use of instructional technologies in ways that provide our students with the supportive learning environment that they need. And a major issue for all the large distance teaching universities, the mega universities, is to develop and maintain systems that allow this environment to operate in support of the needs of individuals as well as the mass of students that they all serve. Some writers on open and distance education have pointed out the tendency of the mega, mega universities to become monolithic and unresponsive. To exemplify what Otto Peters many years ago called the industrial model of distance education. And this has led to the suggestion that the future lies with networks of smaller institutions 
rather than with the now massive single mode open universities that have developed in many parts of the world in the last 30 years. Clearly, the problem of becoming what I have called monolithic and un unresponsive exists for the major distance teaching universities in ways that may not be the case with more conventional institutions. Even though universities are all too frequently very conservative institutions, little inclined to change and less forced to do so. This ought not, however, to be the case with institutions providing open and distance education, which at least at the outset were seen to be staffed by people inclined to rebel against conventional teaching assumptions and methods and to develop innovative solutions to old and new problems. In this context, however, I recall a gloomy conversation in my office in Richmond, British Columbia with Ram Reddy in the late 80s. At that time, the then Open, Open Learning Institute was almost eight years old, and Indira Gandhi National Open University, of which he was still Vice Chancellor, was almost three years old. We both spent some time discussing the progress of the institutions we represented and bemoaning a situation that was becoming increasingly clear in both of them. That is, a growing tendency among staff, particularly founding staff, to look at proposed solutions to emerging problems and to say, but we won't do distance education like that here. It is clearly incumbent upon institutions of open and distance education and upon those who administer them to ensure that at such attitudes do not exist or are at least discouraged. That an institutional climate is in place that encourages continual review and evaluation of what an institution does and how it does it. One of the ways of attempting to secure this situation is to attend to the twin issues of quality assurance and quality control. In order to avoid any confusion, let me first explain the distinction between the two expressions I've just used. The first, quality assurance, can be simply defined as measures taken to avoid faults, as the set of activities undertaken to ensure that standards are first specified clearly and second reached consistently for all the activities in which an institution engages. The second expression, quality control, is defined as measures taken to correct faults, as a retrospective activity eliminating or improving faulty products or services. Both of these op overlapping functions, along with the monitoring of the procedures themselves, together make up quality management. In establishing a system of quality assurance and control, however, a basic question is that of what such a system is seeking to assure. Until recently, it was probably the case that there was almost universal agreement on the purpose of a university, on what features of its activities would be judged as important as indicators of the overall quality of the institution. Increasingly, however, over the last 30 years, this situation has changed so that there is no longer anything approximating to a common standard for judging the quality of an institution's work. In Canada, for example, Maclean's National Weekly News magazine publishes an annual ranking of the country's 80 or so universities, while in British Columbia, the Fraser Institute, a local think tank, issues an annual ranking of the province's high schools. But it is frequently argued, even surprisingly enough, by institutions that do well in these rankings, that they are invalid unless they take into account the extent to which individual institutions meet the purposes for which they design, were designed. In quality assurance jargon, their fitness for purpose. If this is a valid objection, as I think it often is, it follows that there are significant differences in the ways in which quality should be assessed in, say, conventional universities and in those providing open and distance education. Within the latter category, there are, by the same token, differences between 
for example, an apex institution like Indira Gandhi National Open University, the Indian State Open Universities, and the distance teaching arms of conventional universities. These differences need to be taken into account in establishing quality assurance systems for each of them, but within the quant context of what quality it is that we are trying to assure, it is nevertheless the case, I believe, that the one thing that such institutions and programs have in common is that their primary purpose is to provide high quality learning experiences for their students, either in absolute terms, if such a thing exists, or in terms of value added since student entry, and that this is the principal function by which their quality ought to be judged. During the last 10 years or so, the practice of quality management has taken an increasingly central position in institutions of higher education as one of the primary methods of ensuring that they develop and deliver a learning experience to their students that is as effective as possible. This has been true of institutions of open and distance education as well, as teachers and administrators have wrestled with the issues that I have outlined earlier. Indeed, as Alan Tate has argued correctly, I think, distance teaching universities were in many way, ways ahead of conventional institutions in this respect. I recall, for example, the development of a monstrous flowchart laying out the process of course development in the early days of the Open Learning Institute. I use the word monstrous because it consumed two lengths of paper which stretched from ceiling to floor and half that distance again. It was a truly elegant concept that was never, so far as I know, fully implemented before it was tran transplanted by something more manageable. I mention this because the object of the procedure was to ensure that the process of course development was as complete and as foolproof as possible, that the process took every measure to ensure the high quality of the final product. Similar procedures were put in place to monitor the activities of, stu of tutors, of student services, and of other parts of the organization. Part of the reason for these procedures was defensive. We were a new and not particularly popular institution, and we knew that we were being watched. A not uncommon experience for new distance in teaching institutions at that time, and perhaps still. But what we were doing was to establish and implement a system of quality assurance, although in 1979 that expression had not yet penetrated the educational scene. In the intervening 20 years, such measures common to distance teaching universities have been developed and systematized, described and analyzed in a growing body of literature. It is thus possible now to enumerate some broad principles on the basis of which institutions can develop their own policies and procedures. These can be reduced substantially to four, which I will address separately. First, there is a need to establish within any institution a culture of quality assurance that will ensure that it and the activities associated with it become not an isolated and occasional act but a continuous examination and re-examination of what the institution does and how it does it. In the development of quality assurance systems in British universities, for example, the Higher Education Quality Council emphasized this point by establishing a system of one year after reports in which institutions were required a year after a quality audit to review the actions taken as a result of the report and those they propose to take in future to address its recommendations as well as emerging issues. In addition, the Council set up a quality enhancement group that monitored work on quality assurance both in the United Kingdom and elsewhere and provided guidance to institutions and units within them about current developments in and approaches to the subject. The object of these activities was to encourage staff at all levels and in all parts of the institutions to believe that the practice of quality assurance is a continuous 
necessary and central part of their work. The second principle follows from the first. The practice of quality assurance cannot be undertaken in isolation by selected parts of institutions or by units within them. Although procedures will clearly vary from unit to unit with their differ in line with their differing functions, the institutional structure must be seen as a whole and based on common policies and assumptions. Thus, a quality assurance system must embrace the entire organization and emphasize the mutually supportive nature of quality assurance procedures between and among departments. This is not to argue for the establishment of a quality assurance unit, which many people, including me, believe to be unnecessary or even positively harmful, but simply to state clearly the need for integration. If this is the case for conventional universities, universities, it is so much more so for providers of open and distance education. Though I've never been much of a believer in the value of models for such institutions, one of their common features is that all the major functions of the institution, development, production, and distribution of courses, instruction, student support, and so on, must be closely and carefully integrated to provide an effective service for students. Units cannot be allowed to go their own way in isolation from others, and neither, therefore, can their quality assurance policies and procedures. What institutions need for effective quality assurance is a set of processes that establish goals, assess how they are being met, and change practice to make necessary improvements. These involve a regular review of programs, of teaching activities, of support functions, which while administered by individual inst units, must be seen within an overall institutional context. Once again, the third principle follows from the second. I've indicated above that there ought to be strong reservations about setting up a quality assurance unit within an institution. This is because, to be effective, quality assurance cannot be regarded merely as the responsibility of management or of a particular group any more than it is seen to be the responsibility of particular staff. An effective quality assurance system must be embraced by all members of staff within an organization and must become their collective responsibility in fact as well as in theory. Implementation of collective responsibility makes it imperative that all staff should be provided with the fullest possible information about quality assurance procedures and with the training required to ensure that they can implement them. Much of the literature of quality assurance makes the point that in the context of these first three principles, the improvement of quality does not simply happen, that it requires continuing attention. It thus follows that an institution delivering high quality learning outcomes must have its management processes functioning well, its academic support and administrative procedures working smoothly, and above all, an organizational climate that encourages and values improvement. If only one of these factors is absent, then quality will suffer. Another way of saying this is that activities associated with quality assurance must never be seen as a burden for an institution and its staff, must never be viewed as something extra to be carried out to satisfy the demands of senior management or some external body. If this becomes the case, the benefits that quality assurance can bring to an organization will almost certainly be lost. Finally, a separate principle needs to be enumerated, the vital importance of context. I noted earlier that I have difficulty with the notion of model, that models can be useful in designing institutions of open and distance education. This stems from my belief that the shape of institutions must be dictated by 
their particular needs that by the particular needs that they are established to answer and that these unique needs are unique to, to each particular situation. The same consideration applies to quality assurance systems. A, sister, a situation that has been described by Alan Tate in his collection of essays on quality assurance in open and distance education. Quote, no quality assurance system can be translated from one institution to another across organizational, social, and cultural boundaries. The development must be homegrown, recognizing its context. Any off-the-shelf solution from the latest management book or passing consultant will not provide a complete answer. While their simple remedies may seem superficially attractive in the form of instant programs that can be globally applied, such approach approaches are unlikely to do anything but give quality assurance a bad name. I indicated earlier that quality assurance mechanisms must take into account fitness for purpose in individual institutions. Thus, any system involving the establishment of quality assurance for, say, the Indian Open Universities, should, while taking advantage of, uh, of and emphasizing the undoubted commonalities that exist among the institutions, also recognize the differences in purpose and function between them. The final essay in the collection of papers resulting from the Three Nation Tour by Indian distance educators in 1994 was an attempt by Prakash Deshpande, then director of the Distance Education Council, to draw lessons from their views of other systems and institutions. In that paper, he made precisely this point, the development of effective quality assurance systems for Indian distance teaching universities must, while drawing on experience elsewhere, be a local development designed to meet the local needs of the system as a whole as well as of the individual institutions involved. It is this development that properly designed and managed will help the Indian open and distance teaching universities to deal with the challenges I outlined at the outset, the difficult and perilous transmit transition from print-based to technology-based distance and open learning. In terms of the principal, principles involved, this process changes nothing for it involves rather changes in the means of providing and supporting high quality learning outcomes than in the nature of the outcomes themselves. In some ways, the process of quality assurance will undoubtedly become easier as the vital functions of collecting, manipulating and distributing evidence become simpler when they are undertaken electronically. On the other side of the coin, however, as we move towards more resource-based learning with students being asked to discover through the World Wide Web new sources of material rather than being provided with all necessary learning resources, assessment of quality may become more problematic, calling for attention to new skills such as those required to navigate the web, to moderate student efforts and to support this ac these activities. This process will necessarily be a slow and uneven one. For some cohorts of Indian students, use of electronic mail and computer-mediated com communication is already a reality, while for others it will not become so for many years. It will, however, occur and will undoubtedly present serious problems, problems that can nevertheless be effectively managed with clear definition of the goals and assumptions on which each of the institutions involved are operating and of the standards that they will adopt in meeting their goals within a well-designed system of quality assurance. Thank you. I would like to invite Professor A.W. Khan, our Vice Chancellor, to present on behalf of the Indira Gandhi National Open University, a memento to our guest, Professor Mugridge.
can I also request uh, Professor V. S. Prasad to present on behalf of the G. Ramareddy Memorial Lecture Committee a memento to Professor Mugridge. Thank you, Professor Prasad. Well, friends, the session is now open for questions, comments, statements. I'm sure there are many of them. Professor Mugridge, would you please elaborate a little bit more on your, what I perceived an, aver an aversion to having a unit responsible for quality control? You perceived it. <laughs> you perceived it quite correctly. Um, There's a good deal of, of, of discussion in the literature uh, of quality assurance about that, and it comes down about evenly on both sides that you should have one and you shouldn't have one. Uh, I think that part of my aversion to it comes from being part of an institution that had one, and <laughs> which didn't work very well. Um, so that I may well be reaching such a conclusion on a random sample of one. I think, however, that, that the important, the point that I was trying to emphasize is that um, a, quality, a, a system of quality assurance won't be effective unless not merely senior management, not merely experts on quality assurance, not merely department heads, whatever level you want to talk about, but the entire organization buys into it and makes it a part of what they normally do. Um, part of the, part, part of the uh, reason for the comment I made about quality assurance not being regarded as a burden um, came from a discussion I had last week when I was passing through the United Kingdom and I spent some time with my brother and sister-in-law. My sister-in-law asked me what I was talking about today and I said quality assurance and she said, oh God, not quality assurance. And, and this, this projected a flood of, of objection to the way in which quality assurance was being implemented in the organization that she's a part of. And, and it became perfectly clear that the one thing that hadn't been done was to provide the necessary information and training and so on for all of the staff in order that they, should, um, that they could implement it properly. And I think that, that really difficult though that is, um, perhaps impossible, difficult though that is, it's essential to the implementation of an effective system. Yes, I, I, I talked very briefly about um, what quality it is that we're trying to assure um, because I only, <laughs> I only had half an hour to speak. Um, I think that, that at this point institutions like this one indeed any kind of, of post-secondary institution or, or uh, school level institution has very little choice but to, de to try to define uh, what it means by quality from the point of view of, of its students. Um, I, I think that part of the problem with universities in the 40 odd years that I've been associated with them is that they've tended to define what they mean by quality from their point of view rather than from their students' point of view. Uh, and I think that, that difficult though it may be, um, that's what institutions like this one and the other distance teaching universities in this country must do. But it's easy for me to say that because I'm not a university administrator anymore. When we talk about quality assurance as an ideal, in an ideal situation, perhaps I'll go with, along with Professor Madrids that there need not be a separate cell or a unit. Because I, I can see the point why in an institution where there is a general awareness about quality and quality assurance, I think that will be counterproductive, it will become a burden. But in situations where there is not even a low level of consciousness regarding quality, finer definitions and too human an approach will not assure anything. I think it has to be initiated 
by those people who are really concerned about it, whether it comes from the management or from a section of the academics, that should be the starting point. And once you initiate, once you set the ball rolling, slowly the consciousness will rise. And at that time, we can think of more democratic functioning. But where there is no concern, I think even some kind of authoritative measures are justified. This, this answer is not attempting to avoid the question, though it's going to sound like it. Um, I think that what I, what the, my response would be that, that, that each institution should answer what suits its needs best. Uh, I, I was at some pains to point out that I think that, this is, that, that the development of quality assurance systems, as indeed the development of, of almost any other, uh, administrative and, and academic systems are, the con are primarily the concern of individual institutions. And I think that if, if, you, um, if, if your institution needs a, a unit which is primarily concerned with disseminating information and, and, and uh, training and so on about the implementation of quality assurance, then do it. I, I, I really do think it's a local decision, it's an institution by institution decision. Uh, I am A.S. Naran from IGNO faculty. Now, you have said that uh, there has to be some reservation about setting up a quality assurance unit within an institution. Point uh, is that in a situation where that culture of quality assurance has not yet arrived and where the processes which you have explained in number one and two are not yet inculcated in the faculty or, for instance, in a number of specific situations. Is it not necessary that for at least for some time there has to be some sort of a unit within the institution which will monitor some type of quality assurance and at the same time will inculcate that culture in the institution itself? You know, the first thing is to internalize, that's the question I think, is till such time that people have internalized the importance of quality assurance. What is the point in establishing a monitoring system? In fact, right. if one doesn't exist, what is it that you are monitoring? But this morning we were discussing about that the quality is also, it's a question of attitude. It's not, a, of course it requires a set of skills to achieve, but initially it has to be also inculcation of that kind of attitude. The quality consciousness is a question of attitude and I think every institution has to create that kind of a climate so that people will become quality conscious. And that, I think, is the first necessary condition. And uh, I think in, uh, in his uh, lecture, uh, uh, Professor Magritte has very clearly mentioned that it has to be in, within the local context. When you, call, when you talk about local context, that means within the context of a particular institution. Quality assurance is the purpose of, that is, what, for what is it that the institution has been established. There may be a, 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 a distance education unit in a technology institute. The purpose of that would be entirely different from a dedicated open university. So the quality assurance processes and systems and uh, steps that you need to establish will be entirely different. Uh, here is a question from one of our counselors of distance education, Dr. Madhavan. How we can think about quality assurance in distance education in a developing country like India where our primary objective is to democratize education. The genesis of this question also lies in how we organize the student support services, particularly thinking of the learners in the remote area. Well, at times we have to make compromise with quality because we have very little options from the point of view of getting suitable academic counselors right at the remote areas. I am passing over the telephone to our ARD, Mr. Lewis, for another question. Uh, Professor Margaret uh, said, that there could be a transition from print medium or material to technological medium or material for uh, the, uh, what do you call it, by propagating or uh, spreading education. But how is it possible in the context of India? The second question is, uh, I give an example about MCA, that is Master in Compu uh, Computer Applications. Once a student or a learner completes uh, by that time when he goes out of our institution or uh, the university, he becomes almost a kind of outdated fellow. By that time the courses in computer education keeps on developing. How are we going to implement it in distance education? 
it may be possible in the conventional system. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the, the first uh, part of the question uh, that Professor Ghosh asked, uh, how we can achieve any kind of quality in a developing country. I, th I, 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 Professor Ghosh, I really do not agree with, uh, with that observation because let, let me say, let me give you an example from agriculture. Just because we are a poor country, that means we don't go, don't go and distribute poor quality seed. There is need for using better quality seed in order to produce, to be more productive, to produce better quality, more nutritive food. Yes, you have to graduate from use exclusively of printed material to technology that are more user friendly, technology that are more versatile, technologies that bring different learning resources to our students. It is a matter of time. A few years ago, it would have been very difficult even for us to talk about use of World Wide Web. Today, several thousand of our students are using World Wide Web. In developing countries, if our objective is just to print the material and supply it to certain number of uh, learners which we set as a target, that itself is a quality. I mean to say that quality is the uh, degree of acceptability with which we want to deliver our goods. In case of developing countries, if we want to deliver our goods through print materials only, that to, for example, 1 lakh students in a year, then if we could deliver it by 1st of January of our academic session, which would be commencing time, then we have 100 percent achieved the quality as far as that particular aspect is concerned. If students submit the assignments by the prescribed date for submission of the assignment, they are 100 percent uh, sure they have achieved their quality in terms of uh, uh, confining to the date of submission. So that is how for every aspect of the system there is a set quality because that is the standard we have set for particular aspect. So that is how quality has to be seen. There is no particular definition for that thing because they, they, there will not be any acceptability by all. Universal acceptability is always a difficult thing. Well, you noticed, I hope, that, that uh, one of the expressions I used was that solutions from the latest management textbook or person consultant were likely not to be very good ones. And I, I really do believe that. Um, I think, however, that, that external um, experts, if you like, can help institutions develop quality assurance systems, as they can in most other uh, areas too, simply by raising the consciousness of people, by informing them of what's happened in other places, of, of helping them develop answers to their own problems. But I think the important thing is 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 not to try is is for consultants not to be arrogant enough to come in and, and, and pretend that they have answers to other people's problems because they don't. Um, many years ago, I I uh, was in charge of a, a Canadian international development agency project at the Open University in Indonesia. Um, as it began. And after I'd been going there for several years, I said to the founding rector one day, what was it that made you choose us out of all the other foreign aid packages that you could have had to help you develop your university? And his answer, which I think should be painted on the ceiling over every consultant's bed, was because you, came, you, you were the only people who came to me without the answer to all my problems. <laughs> 